And then we got today to how to prepare. Now I'm going to start with the Bible verse that you already read. A certain man had a fig tree planted. And he took care of the tree and he came to find fruits. And there was no fruits. You remember the story? How many of you remember the story? The parable. And so he came again and he put fertilizer and he dug around the tree and he put hay around the roots and then he put horse manure. That's the best one, you know. And anyway, no fruits. And he watered the tree and he did everything that you can do, gardeners. No fruits. Nice leaves, a bunch of them, no fruits. So the owner of the property came and says to the gardener, what are you doing there? It takes space. Cut it off, put a different tree. I want fruits. I want to use that space. That's poor business what you do. And the gardener says, I've been taking care of this tree for so long since the tree was small. I love this tree. Give him another year. I will water the tree. I will fertilize the tree. I will bless the tree. I'm going to give him resources. I will protect him. I will empower him. I will do whatever it takes. Hopefully, he will produce some fruits. If not, you can cut it off. And the owner said, okay, give him one more year. And if he doesn't make fruits, cut it off. You know who is he talking about, don't you? Who? Give him another year. That's called borrowed time. And we live in borrowed time. I'm going to give you an example. Last winter, we had a tough winter. That's my fig tree. <laughs> yes, I mean that. I worked with those trees for three years. And I got them big, and they used to produce fruits. Chandra, you remember the figs? They were nice. Many, every day I would go and pick up a whole plate of figs from six fig trees. All six died. My wife blamed the number. She said, you should have had seven, not six. <laughs> I said, there is nothing to do with the number. It's the winter that was tough. Well, I talked to somebody from a nursery, and they said, the trees are not dead. They are just in coma. The roots are still alive. Water them, fertilize them, take care of the soil around, and they will come back. So I did that. I started to dig the soil around dead coma trees and water the dead trees doesn't make any sense I said I'm going to try one more year if not I'm going to cut them off and water the dead trees and fertilize and put everything and guess what happened you'll be impressed this is a real picture in front of my house I mean it what do you think can you see the figs huh a bunch of it. In fact, this week, I ate figs. I kind of picked up from every tree, like a handful of them. I have five, not six. One never came back. But hey, five better than nothing. And I, I took pictures of all five. And my wife said, too many pictures. Cut it off. One is enough. Okay. So I took pictures of all five because I was so proud. And they all came back. And they are small, but they are packed. Everywhere, everywhere with little figs. And some of them already turned dark and they are soft. And I started to eat figs. And I'm so happy because they produce figs. And I said, you know what? They seem to be dead. But they were only in coma. They were asleep like the ten virgins, you know. So I hope you get the picture. So let's go into our subject. Listen. God called his church to produce fruit. When God talks about the fig trees, God had not so much interest in the trees. He was talking about people. He was talking about his people, you and me. And God says, hey, I've been blessing you. You have all you need. You have all the resources in the world. I gave you everything. I didn't give it to you so you have a comfortable life. It's not about this life. I gave it to you for a reason. When God called Abraham, God called Abraham, not, hey, I call you so you will be rich and have a good life. God called him to be a, for, to be a blessing for all nations. Do you remember that? God called Abraham again to be what? God called Abraham to be what? You don't have courage to say it. To be a blessing for all nations. 
God didn't call you to have a good life. God called you to be a blessing. And he gave you resources that you pass them on and you bless others. Bless and you'll be blessed. Give and you'll be which one comes first? First I want to receive and then I can think if I give. Give and then you'll receive. A big measure. Basically God gave us so much. And it seems to me, unfortunately, church, that the more we get, the more comfortable we become and the more we want. And the more isolated we become and we forget that God didn't give it to us for us. God gave it to us for them. You follow me? It seems to me that we keep forgetting that. And so, some people even say to me, I don't have enough, I am poor, I cannot give. Listen, don't, get, don't wait to get more. Don't wait for a better chance. Don't wait to get trained. Don't wait until you get retired. Don't wait until the problems are solved. Work with whatever you have. As God told Moses, oh, I have only a stick. Go with a stick. Whatever you have. I don't care, poor or rich. Whatever you have. Remember the story I told you about Cuba? About the lady that had a $12 a month salary feeding 150 kids? She could have said, I have only $12 a month. But she would buy rice and feed 150 kids in her neighborhood. And she said, I got to use what God gave me. That's called faithfulness. Use what you have. You know, some people tell me, every time I serve, Satan attacks me. Yes! Don't you know that by now? Satan hates you when you work. But you are not called to fight Satan. This is nonsense to fight darkness. You don't turn off darkness. You turn on light. And darkness disappears. And when you turn off light, darkness comes in. So it tells me that when people have problems, they turn off light. We all do that every once in a while. You turn on light, darkness is out. You turn off light, darkness is back in. You follow me? Then you turn it back on, darkness is out. How do you turn it on? 24-7 connection with Jesus. When Jesus comes in, Satan moves out. They just don't live together. So, let me start the subject. In Luke chapter 13, Jesus talks about the fig tree, and this is about God's people today. We are living in borrowed time. Let me give you an example. When Israel got to the promised land, to Canaan, to Jordan, to the border. God said, this is the land. Go in, take it. It's yours. Did they go in? We build up, we get there. They didn't go in because they were not ready. It took them how long until they got back there? Well, the, yes, 40 years. The Bible says a whole generation perished. You remember? None of that generation entered in heaven except two. And the next generation came. It was one generation that had to perish because they were not ready. The spirit of prophecy says that in 1888, Jesus was ready to come and the church was not ready. Listen, folks, I'm going to go in details today. And as we go in details, we'll learn how to be ready because the time has passed long ago to bear fruits. God has been blessing and it hurts to see that we are not ready and we don't bear any fruits. We are not ready for Jesus coming. If you would have to see the pain and to listen to the pain that God is listening and watching day and night, you would not wait any longer either. You would come if you are God. So, let's move into the subject. Matthew 10, Jesus says to the disciples, Go first to whom? To the last ship of Israel. Who do you need to preach to first? How to get ready? Listen, folks, we will learn today how to get ready. Who do you need to go first to? Outside or inside? Okay, what to tell the church? Listen, Lexington Church, God wants me to tell you this. What? As you go to whom? To Israel, to God's people, to SDAs, Preach saying, what? 
The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Basically, what do you have to tell the church? Oh, start paying tithe, do evangelism, uh, come to church, start in... Is that what you are supposed to tell them? No, that is good stuff, all of it. But you know what? The church needs to realize that Jesus is coming. That's what gets us ready. That's what you begin with. The heaven is at hand. It's coming. No more borrowed time. This is it. That's it. Jesus is coming. But listen carefully. If you keep reading, because in the original Bible there were no chapters, no verses. It was all... No period, no comma, no nothing. Masoretz put that. In the original Bible there was no chapters, no verses, no comma, no... So listen carefully. You keep reading. Go to the lost ship of Israel, to my people, to the SDAs, and tell them, don't go to the Gentile, Jesus says. Go to the church. And tell them, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then, as you talk to them, as you preach, listen. Tell them, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast demons. Oh, by the way, demons in the church because you go to the church. Demons in the church? Yes! There are demons in the church. I'm not talking about people. I'm talking what is in people. <laughs> Anything, church, that to distract us from serving is demons keeping us busy. Did you hear what I said? One says, oh, I cannot come, Lord, because I just got married. Family can distract you. Oh, I cannot come, I just bought a property. Resources could distract you. Oh, I cannot come because I purchased you know, some oxen, and I have to go and try them. Jobs, work can distract you. You agree? Whatever, good or bad, would distract you from serving, it's Satan sending his demons to keep you from serving. You heard what I said? So, back to the chapter. Jesus says, go first to Israel, preach saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, heal, cleanse, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. What is supposed to tell the church? Hey, church, Jesus is coming. Therefore, listen carefully, go and serve. Do, do you follow? Do you see the verse? Jesus is coming. What should I do about? Oh, just wait. Are you supposed to just keep our eyes up and just do nothing and wait? Oh, Jesus is coming. I am waiting. That's what Jesus called us to do? Because he's coming, do the work. When you get an inspection, what do you do? You do the work, you prepare, you are ready. You follow me? Because Jesus is coming. Go and heal, go and serve, go on. You follow me? So, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, running over. For with what measure you give, with that very measure, will come back to you. Church, I want to say this. The world can see that something is happening. It is sad when the church is so busy with self that the church doesn't see that something is happening. We say we are waiting for Jesus, but I am afraid that the way we live sometimes says that while we say we are waiting, we don't act like we are waiting for Jesus. If you believe that Jesus is coming indeed and everything is going to burn and you take nothing to heaven. The single treasure according to the Bible that you take to heaven is people and hopefully yourself. You don't take the house, the car, the job, the whatever. You don't take them to heaven. Doesn't matter how nice they are. Only treasure that you can save in heaven is people that you save. Jesus didn't come to, to raise money, to save the buildings. To, Jesus came to save people. That's all you take to heaven. Basically, many times I wonder if we believe, if we are Seventh-day Adventists. Adventist means that we are waiting for the second coming. If we believe that Jesus is coming, why do we behave different? Because we should invest in people. And I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about everything. We should invest in people. We should have a heart for people as Jesus has a heart for people. Aren't we supposed to be his followers to do what he did? How can you say that you love God if you don't love people? So, back. 
does God people know that Jesus is coming? If they do, they should heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. For instance, I was in Turnu Severin. That was the city where I was born, in Romania. And the church was a good church. They were paying tithe better than any other church. And they were coming to church, and the membership had 270 in the books, and they had like 300 attending every Sabbath. Old and young, everybody came, including people that have no car, and they had to walk like 10 kilometers or whatever. Everybody came. But the whole church was in a web of criticism and gossip. Everybody was eating everybody else, cannibals. Fights, political fights, morals broken, somebody sleeping with seven other ladies. Perfect number. Seven. Yes, yes, that happened actually. I'm not going to give you names, but that happened. And he was called to the board. And he says, This is what you did. And he says, Yeah, with your wife. And it was a mess. And the pastor had to disfellowship so many people. And it was a pain. The whole church fighting, everybody fighting, everybody gossiping, everybody. It was a mess. It was a mess. And the pastor, you need to wake up. You need to get your life together. You need to, you know, you need to get your ducks in a row. You need to, nothing. And you know what happened, church? Persecution. The police came, and the police wanted to take our church and to close it and demolish it and put us in prison. And we, we wanted to kind of not to go to prison, you know, I think it was normal. And we wanted to have a church because we are Adventists, we feel good when we go to church on Sabbath. And if we keep Sabbath, we think that's it. If you go to church and eat okay, that's it. Well, that's not it. That's good, but not enough. So when the police came to the gates of the church, and we realized that we go to prison, guess what we did? We were all inside, and the police was outside, and the gates were locked. You know what we did? We got on our knees, everybody. My father told me the whole board, they kneeled down and they started to pray. And there was no answer to prayer. And the more they prayed, the more they got in trouble. And the more they prayed, the more they sensed that God is not there. So one of them suggested to the others, how can we ask for God's presence if we live in sin? So they started to confess, hey, I've been criticizing you. Would you please forgive me? And he, she comes back, I've been criticizing and hating you. Would you forgive me too? And they hugged each other and cried. And then he went to the other person. Hey, I'm sorry, I talked about you with that elder. And I told him bad things about you. Would you forgive me? And she started to cry and she says, I did that about you too. And then he went to the other one. And they all started to talk and confess sins. And they all started to cry. And as they confessed, they sensed the Holy Spirit coming and filling that place. And as they did that, the police left the gate. And they just left. So they told the church, and next Sabbath, my father started in front of the church, hey, I want to ask forgiveness for what I did. And the other one, and the whole church got up, and they each one went to each one, and they started to ask forgiveness, and to hug each other, and to cry. And they built a new church, and the whole communist regime could do nothing against. It was a revival. Do, do you follow me? You don't wait for Jesus to come just because you go to church and keep Sabbath. That doesn't do it. You need to do something about it. You need to act on it. Listen, there are always three groups. When it was 9-11, you remember? Years ago. You read the books and they say there were three groups in those buildings, tall tower, towers. There were three groups of people. A small group, when it happened, guess what they did? They acted down the stairs. And it took them 15 minutes, but they got out. A small group of people that they acted right away. And they were saved. And there was a second group of people, hey, you don't need to, just nothing's going to happen. Just sit down, don't worry. They were trying to calm everybody down. Don't worry. They are those who are Satan's people. Don't, you don't need to, don't worry about it. Peace. They are Satan's people in the church. Do nothing. Be indifferent. If you come to church and you keep Sabbath and you pray, that's okay. You don't need to act on it. That's crazy. The pastor is crazy. What is evangelism? Bible studies? Very good. 
You keep Sabbath, you go to church, you eat good, you, you know. Eh, that's what you are called to do. Those who discourage others, who serve Satan by discouraging others from working. But then there is a third group, the great majority. The first two groups are very small. The third group is those people who want to act, but they have no courage. There was a group that they say they froze. They froze. They were unable to even think or move. Uh! I've been in a plane when the plane started to shake. And there was a lady next to me, and she was like a rock. I said, are you okay? I said, can you answer? I want you to call the, the, the flight attendant. I mean, like Lot's wife? Not moving? I said, you okay? And she, huh? She froze. I said, hey, calm down. We pray, and we are in God's hands, you know? She, I cannot pray. Why not? I cannot think. I said, you talk to me? That means you think. And then the plane stopped from shaking. Oh, we thought we'd lose the wings, you know. But we didn't. I was in Cuba. Hey, I'm not trying to discourage you, folks. When we took off from Cancun to fly to Havana, the right wing of the plane got on fire. Visible, the engine. And they came and put the fire off. And I thought they would put us on a different plane. And they said, that's all we have. And they started the plane and we flew again. Oh, what an experience. Now you are happy you don't come, huh? <laughs> there is a third group that they want to do it, but they don't have the courage to do it, and they just wait for a better opportunity. Guess what, folks? It's not going to come. Those who stayed in the Twin Towers and didn't act, they perished. You'll not get another opportunity. This is the another year that you get at a, as a fig tree. You don't act, you perish. Some people even say, you know, uh, I don't have enough, I am poor. And they forgive, folks, that the Lord, when he called you to go, he promised that he would go with you. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He says the world is mine, everything. Listen, folks, God, it may, it may be economical crisis in the world. God, there is no economical crisis in heaven. God doesn't have a money problem. God doesn't have a resources problem. God has a people problem. You follow me? God owns everything. If he says to the money, move from here to there, or to the gold, or to the mountains, or to the sea, you know what happens when God says to the money, move? Money, move! God doesn't have a money problem. God has a people problem. And that's called lack of trust. Could be called two different things, either selfishness or lack of trust. Some people are all for me, and some people say, I want to do it, but what's going to happen? I don't pay my bills. I got to pay my bills first. Lack of trust. God says, test me. Give and I promise it will be given back to you with the same measure. So if you keep giving, I'll keep giving to you so you have what to keep giving. You follow me? Throw your bread on the water, and it's going to come back. That's the promise. And my God keeps his word. The whole point is this. Do you really trust God? Do you really believe what you say when you say, I trust that you'll keep? He says, seek first, and the other things will be provided. Do you trust that if you do your job and use the resources he gave you, and I am not talking about money, that would be simple. I am talking about the whole life. I am talking about your time. I am talking about the talents that God gave you. Use whatever God gave you. You follow me? And God promised, if you do that and put me first, I will bless you. God didn't bless you so you have a good life. God blessed you so you serve. 